Welcome back to our sixth and final segment on giving. Today I just want to wrap up a few kind of odds and ends. One of the things that we notice in the Bible a lot is that when, when people get everything they're after, when they kind of get everything they desire, they abandon God. Uh, we see this warning from Moses to the people of Israel as they're on the verge of the promised land. We see it in Deuteronomy 8, 9, 10, and 11, and in various places within those texts. And one of the things that Moses says to the people is he says, look, when you come into the promised land, because for 430 years, they were, the people were slaves in Egypt, and then for 40 years, they've been wandering in the wilderness, surviving off of manna and the occasional quail and water from a rock, right? Not like primo meals. And so here they are now coming into the verge of the promised land. And Moses says to them, look, be careful when you have everything that you want. Be careful when you have fields that you didn't plant and crops that you didn't have to work for. Be careful when you have houses that you didn't build because they were taking over these people's land. They're going to push them out. He says, be careful when you have everything that your heart doesn't become proud and that you turn away from God. We see that in, in chapter 8. We also see it, I think, in chapters 11 and 14 as well. Uh, but it's a theme that we see throughout the Bible. Solomon is the son of David, and Solomon's son, his name is Rehoboam. And the Bible says that for the first three years of his kingship, he served the Lord. But once his kingdom was firmly established in his hand, he began to rely on himself. And I wonder how many times we kind of approach money the same way. That we have this idea in mind, this target in mind, and we're asking God, please help me to do better at my job. Please help me to get my car fixed. Please help this. Please help. And then as we become more and more successful, I have to kind of wonder if it's not also our tendency to kind of move away from God. And I just think that that's something we need to think about, something we need to be aware of, right? The Bible does tell us in Matthew that you can't serve both God and mammon or money. Uh, the idea is kind of a personification. The Greek word is kind of a personification of money. It's really possessions. Like you can't have a heart that says, I need everything, and also a heart that declares you need God. That those two things will be at war with one another. They'll kind of be at odds with one another. It's also not saying that you can't be an affluent Christian, right? There were a lot of people like Barnabas, who was clearly an affluent Christian. Uh, Abraham was a very uh, affluent person of faith in the Old Testament. And so it's not saying that you can't have success. It's just kind of this warning that sometimes uh, the multiplication of success can, can detract from your heart for God, which is, is why Paul warns Timothy and he has the, him warn the rich people within the church in 1 Timothy. And he, he tells them that uh, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Not that having money is the root of all sorts of evil, but the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And then he tells at the end of 1 Timothy 6, he, he tells Timothy to remind those who are rich to be generous with their riches. And so again, this isn't saying you can't be successful and you can't make it in, in your business world or in your career, or maybe I can't, you know, make it in the art world. It's not saying that. It's just saying that you have to be careful to, to make sure that your heart, the pursuit of your heart is God and not the things, not the wealth, right? Because if, you're, if your heart is about the wealth, the pattern of the Bible, okay, the pattern of the scripture that we see is people who have their heart set on the thing, when they get the thing, they're done with God. Think about it like this. In Matthew 13, uh, there's four soils that are kind of analogous to different people who, who have heard the gospel. The first soil is, is the seed that falls on the rocky soil. I'm not going to preach Matthew 13 right now. Sorry. Let me just narrow it down for you. One of the things that it says is that one of the seeds of the gospel falls in soil that is also planted with weeds. And the, the plant and the weeds grow up together and the weeds choke out the plant and it dies. And what Jesus says in Matthew 13 is it's the deceitfulness of wealth. So there are people who will hear the gospel of Jesus and go, man, that sounds good. But then their eyes get distracted by the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth. And they're like, ah, never mind. I'm out. This isn't people who have lost their salvation. This is people who heard the gospel. They're like, yeah, that sounds appealing. I like it. But then their eyes are carried away from God by riches. And so we need to be careful with that. So ask yourself, this is a good thing to check yourself on. Am, am I motivated by the thing or am I motivated? motivated by Christ. Having the thing is okay. I don't want you to hear that we have to live in poverty. Uh, Paul says in Philippians that there were times that he had want in his life, lack in his life. And Paul also says that there were times he had plenty. And so that might be us too, right? But maybe not. Maybe you're like Barnabas. Maybe you're affluent and maybe you have plenty of wealth. Fine. 
That's not a sin. That's not problematic. The thing we have to focus on, though, is make sure that our hearts are set on God and not on the wealth. The wealth is not our, our safety net. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are saved. And we know that verse, but a verse later or a verse before, I can't remember, don't hold it against me, says that the, the wealth is the strong tower of the wicked and it collapses. And, and so there's this idea that, that the wicked put their confidence in wealth. We don't want to do that. Our confidence is in God, whether we are poor or whether we are rich. And so we want to make sure that that's the case. One other parting thought. Paul addresses this in a couple of places in the scripture. Uh, in, in Philippians 4, he talks about the Macedonian church meeting his financial needs so that he didn't have any lack anymore. It, we see in 1 Corinthians 9 that Paul says that he has, as a preacher of the gospel, the right to demand pay for the gospel. And to the Corinthian church, he doesn't do that. Uh, we're not completely sure why. He just says he needed, it was for the sake of the gospel. There was some reason that he felt demanding payment of the Corinthian church would have hindered the gospel there, so he didn't. But Paul says that the worker is worthy of his wages, and that those who preach the gospel should earn their living from the gospel. And he quotes an Old Testament verse that says uh, that the you don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. So the picture here is an ox tied to a, a grind mill, and all the grain is in the vat, and the ox is spinning around grinding the grain, and they don't, they don't muzzle the ox. In other words, if he's hungry while he's grinding the grain, he, he gets to eat some of it. And so Paul says that's the same thing of, of those who preach the gospel, that they should earn their living from the gospel. In fact, even in, I have to look at it here, 1 Timothy 5, he reminds that those who preach the gospel, uh, those elders who preach the gospel should be considered worthy of double honor, that they sh their, their needs should be met. And so think about what that looks like. I think we have ideas of what that looks like. Uh, I think that sometimes we, we kind of make an across the board, you know, statement about what that has to look like. I've, I've had friends who are missionaries who said, well, my pastor friends in Indonesia, they only get $1,000 a month and they're happy with that. And you're like, well, yeah, but that's what my insurance costs for my entire family, <laughs> you know, like, uh, so I think that there's some, we have to kind of think about what that, that means. I don't think it means we need a Learjet or anything, uh, but uh, when we're giving, we're taking care. Here are some thoughts. God is the one, parting thoughts, God is the one who meets all of our needs. All of our confidence is in Him. We are not required by the law to give a tithe. We are, we are asked by God to give generously and joyfully, to give out of our abundance into other people's lack. We, we are asked by God to serve the saints, to meet the needs of the saints. From a practical standpoint, we are also in our culture trying to meet the needs of the church and to take care of the pastors. But we are, we are all of this pursuing God and giving out of our abundance and giving generously and joyfully so that it will result in thanksgiving and praise to God. That is that is the end goal of our giving, that it would result in thanksgiving and praise to God. And so as you think about these things, talk about them, discuss them, uh, this isn't the end of the conversation. It's the end of our video series, but it doesn't have to be the end of our dialogue. And so continue to think about these things. Talk about them at home and talk about them in your small groups and think about what the Bible has to say truly about giving. Thanks so much for watching these. I look forward to starting a new series with you soon. Have a great day.